It's really a great pleasure to be here again. For the regulars, you all probably know that this is my 22nd straight years of speaking at DDP. And uh, I used to be a very shy speaker, so I was really scared when I stand up here. But <laughs> now, no more. <laughs> no such thing. That's a bit foolish, I guess, when you were young. <coughs> anyway, the, the pleasure today is, is that I shall be able to speak about a subject that is very and dear to me. It's about sunspot activity cycles. I've been studying this subject for quite a long time now. As you imagine, I started by not knowing what a sunspot is. Even when I finished my PhD, that's how badly educated I was. And then, <coughs> I guess I learned quickly, or not so quickly, depending on what you, how you see it. This year, all of a sudden, everything fell in places together. So I get to be able to write two very, very important paper in my humble opinion and uh, they are one of them is already published and then this is the only time also I get to say that I'm affiliated with Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics since the paper can be published because that's the only work that I'm allowed <coughs> to speak publicly or write papers with names on uh, my, my affiliation on it and then this year I happen to have another new uh, affiliation of all places is Institute of Earth Physics and Space Physics in Hungary. So <coughs> this institute obviously love that I speak about subject like this. So I would say that I'm here not speaking on behalf of Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. It's all my own view. But then my friend in Hungary shall be very proud that I'm able to do this under their banner. And I also want to thank, of course, David Legates, our good friend who's here. Uh, and then my other colleagues like Victor Velasco Herrera. Here he is. He's a very, very uh, technically smart person. He's a theoretical physicist, trained in Russia, actually, of all places. And uh, we have worked for already almost uh, 15 years together. We published many, many, many papers. And then, but he is the, among the expert on a lot of these uh, new methods of uh, doing analysis like wavelets and uh, all the new concept, like now we're going to use something called a machine learning, which is some aspect of artificial intelligence. So we shall see how we use these uh, methods to study sunspot. I think, let me see. Let's start with this uh, short movie. Almost a resemblance of cyclone and hurricanes, actually the edge of the sun. The sun is obviously a very big object. If you compare to the Earth, it's obviously a, a, <coughs> a giant for, for the system. But of course, here we're not talking about sizes, the importance of sun. It's mainly the energy that it provided to Earth, obviously. It's at least two billion times uh, stronger than, than the Earth uh, power, which is two times 10 to the 17. Even now, the most world powerful laser should be able to pulse this at this energy level now. And these are, of course, done by University of Shanghai group, the laser group. And we all know very well that the sun is supposed to supply all the energy in the system, yet we all know very well what the United Nations IPCC is always saying, yes? Because uh, they're going to have uh, the sixth assessment report, which will be coming out very, very soon within the next few months. So they are now busy preparing this uh, final approval by all the governmental officials. But it's really good to remind ourselves, why is it that they are always able to pull such a, such a, such a stun in, in a sense that it's just unbelievable, but it's all tricks. There's nothing to do with science, that's the point. So you look at this picture. The way they frame the problem is always about framing the problem. They say that the sun, for example, can produce net changes of the so-called 
quote unquote radiative forcing of only 0.04 watt per meter square. And then CO2, this huge, enormous 1.82 numbers. Obviously, if, if, if the worst climate system were to work that way, I think, sure, hands down, they win. Again, it's not about winning or losing. It's about what are the truth, right? One thing that they clearly forget when they show a picture like this is obviously that it's a very obvious thing since the day of Newton and Galileo Galilei and you know, all these people, Copernicus. We have to, under the gravitational field of the solar system, we have to go around the sun in such a very interesting, uh, not circular but elliptical orbits. And the most obvious thing we see on Earth is obviously this phenomenon, right? Which is really standing at a single location that Earth might film it for about a year. It's season, it's how the angle of the sun going up, appearing up and down above the horizon. But the true picture that you want to study about the energetics of the system is basically this way of presenting. So I put it baseline versus baseline plus change. Because what IPCC want to frame the problem is that to set your minds that you only got to look at the net radiative forcing. This is the same information but presented in a very different way. Now, immediately you can see that no matter what CO2 do, okay, that the, they could never beat the sun in terms of the total energy power, right? So, to put it in a simpler way to see this is actually to put this uh, very interesting, uh, what I call analogy. <coughs> Just imagine that refrigerator prairie is the climate system, right? The reason why IPCC says that uh, the sun cannot do anything to push the climate system is because the sun obviously is a King Kong in the climate system. CO2 is the is El Gore. El Gore here, by the way, I've been waiting for his phone call for many, many years until now. I still haven't got one. <coughs> they say that because the King Kong is on diet, he's drinking some water, so he, he gained relatively very small amount of weight. So therefore, he cannot push refrigerator ferry. That's the argument. El Gore is having a lot of hamburger, so he really gained a lot of weight. And then, so therefore, he should be able to take refrigerator ferry and push it up and down. Obviously, this is just a very sick joke in some sense. It's a very inappropriate way of, of presenting science is a, in a way, right? This is how they trick everybody. It's as simple as that. Until today, they won't admit this. No matter how many papers we publish, no matter how many talks we say, they still do the same thing. Of course, we must resist. Or else, what is their reason to live, actually, right? We really have to resist all this kind of nonsense. It's a very, very bad thing. So quantitatively, it's much, much easier to see from this perspective. You have the graph showing the total irradiance energy from January to 12. And the whole sun one is basically the, 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 the seasonal yearly cycle, right? And then if you look at the CO2, it's actually that little amount. Right? So no matter what you do, the CO2 could never, never be anywhere close to what the energetic. Plus that this is actually, you all know about visible sunlight versus infrared radiation, right? Everything that the Earth is doing is actually a reaction to what the input energy from the sun. So it's a, it's a response of the system to a sick certain kind of energetic equilibrium. So it's very appropriate to say that uh, blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth, especially Al Gore and IPCC. The fun part is, of course, this, this uh, sketch is done by my wife, who's unfortunately never be able to come to DDP yet, still has to go to work. And this is exactly the kind of picture since we're in Arizona. Look, how close is the, the, the visitor center? Come to the crater. <laughs> so, well, in any case, I have good news to report to you. I want to provide three positive news today based on the three papers that I happen to be able to write this, uh, this year. But of course, I have many more papers and thanks to people like Mr. F uh, Cathy and Bob Phelan for supporting and help, help out in actually doing a lot of this thing. Every little bit help. By the way, I also formed my own uh, company to be able to do a lot of this site research. It's called series.com, seriesscience.com. So please tell more people about this. So this year, we're able to provide this paper. It's actually very strange now. It's supposed to appear in a June issue. And now it's already August. And it's still somehow, I think some sabotage is happening, but I hope not. We have 23 co-authors, distinguished co-authors, and then we have 530 references in this paper. It's to review how the sun and the earth are connected, uh, are connected, right? So please consider this paper. And here is the bottom line. The bottom line in our paper is that we are able to show, okay, 
So what is the problem in terms of studying sun and earth system or earth system? It's actually what the, wha how good are the thermometer data? On the left, you will see that it's basically the IPCC approach. They actually say that all the thermometer we have now is good enough that they have corrected for all these other problems of non-climatic factors. So they say, yeah, you can accept this result. Yeah, we, by the way, to do this result, we want to make, make it as uncontroversial as possible so we show both sides. I clearly have my opinion. My opinion is basically this result. Okay? The other side is basically take out all the urban stations and then only consider the rural station over all northern hemisphere. And then we show you that we actually can model very, very close. And absolutely, we do not need to be explained by CO2 at all. There's no role for CO2 here. But we keep it open-minded and in case somebody can show us something better. But the whole purpose is that IPCC say that no, the sun cannot ever do it. It's always the, the other side, the left-hand side that is correct. Remember, they say we never have peer review paper to do this. Now we have this most comprehensive review paper that I could possibly glue together and work together. We essentially know this result for a long time, except my brilliant colleague uh, Ronan Connolly, who spoke here uh, 2019. And we put together these results and then we invited all the credible scientists to join us. And in fact, we, good, good news is that you can see scientists from Germany, from Argentina, from China, from everywhere is willing to join us in this endeavor to try to stand up and tell IPCC, excuse me, we are, a lot of us are disagreeing with what you have to say. Now I want to get back to the aspect of a uh, sunspot cycle. But there is some very, very uh, things, good reason always to ask yourself, why you bother to study the sun? Of course, here I want to point to something quite interesting and deep in the, in the sense that there is some interesting connection. You got fish like this who actually can absorb 99% of the sunlight. Okay, I call it sun's fish. And you know that uh, the, the cycle, follow the, the cycle of the sun is very, very important. In 2017, they did give a Nobel Prize in medicine to three of these fellows. Right? It's mainly talking about the important role of this uh, molecular clock and all the switch in the system. That the system really, really are very sensitive to sunlight, exposure to sunlight. And then the really, really interesting, surprising, this is on, uh, of course, day to night only. But then there are another time scale that is very important, which is the season that I'm trying to promote. It's basically you realize about immunity system, right? Thousands of genes, you know, differ because of whether you are winter or summer. And this work is done by a University of Cambridge uh, uh, scientist who study diabetes, by the way, Professor uh, John, uh, John Todd, actually. So it's a very, very interesting paper that shows this kind of evidence, that shows you that you look, you have that many of a uh, summer gene response, the, the basically the blue curve, and then the, the, there's also the equivalent opposite in different hemisphere, which is the, the, the winter gene response system. Not only that, the most recent paper, you can even find it, this kind of gene expression in placenta. So there are some interesting link. Here's the results. Of course, it's more noisy, but clearly show you that there are some very strong imprint of uh, seasonal cycles in how the gene expression, right? And then finally, in Norway, where they have a very good uh, database in terms of uh, infant survival and uh, woman fertility, so they study this record, so they are able to show that indeed, if you want to live fire longer, ask your mom for a birthday during solar minimum, not, not during solar maximum, right? Actually, I'm very lucky. I born on a solar minimum time, so, <laughs> so expect five years or longer life. So are we in the age of enlightenment or age of anti-science, right? Sunspot, the most ancient subject, right, that we've been studying. You can actually see this through naked eye. This is one of the examples. And then my good colleagues here is actually studying something from the Mayan culture. And uh, Professor Richard Zito, who is also in the audience, I'm very glad to be able to finally meet him. And this is one of his paper that is uh, showing this uh, study of uh, spots. I mean, the, the Mayan culture already realized that there are spotted sun, right? So they are already showing up in their representation of their deity, right? And these are stuff going back <laughs> 200, 199 AD, right? And then another example is basically another god that clearly from their 
point of view is that these are all really related to the sun and then they clearly realize that the sun is actually spotted, not a very pure object as, as other, other culture believe. The Chinese has also observed this thing very, very early on, right? This is uh, another one from uh, 837 uh, AD. Okay, they already written down a lot of historical record. And then in my uh, semi-popular books, called the Mondo Minimum, and this is just to honor the Mondo Minimum, the, the Mondas families. And uh, I point out uh, Shang Dynasty. The, in a lot of this oracle bone, there's already quite a lot of uh, 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 marks that people, Chinese, already realize about the, the spotted sun. Okay, That's really long, long ago, right? A few thousand years. And then in the more modern uh, Ming Dynasty, this is the emperor that actually painted uh, spots on his, uh, his uh, except I think his paintbrush is a little bit too rough. <laughs> so too, too large of a sunspot size. So there's still no clear scientific information there except for a lot of these uh, qualitative uh, ideas that, that the sun is actually has a lot of spots. And then here you have uh, two connections between the west and the east. Here is uh, December 8, uh, one, uh, 1128 by John of Worcester that noticed about a spot, draw up a, a picture and even publish this document. And then in Korean uh, archive in the Aurora, you actually have something very close of an Aurora event of, uh, of some five days later, right? And then the Russian are also very much into the, the, the study of the sun. Here's one among the very, very early description of the solar prominences. These are actually all the large object that is actually coming out from the, if you view the sun from the edge. So you'll be able to see a lot of this behavior. So they show, and there are a lot of early descriptions. So here is go back 1185, right? And here's uh, basically what they're talking about, the solar prominences, right? And then one of the most famous one is the one I view in 1946. Huge. This is really 200,000 kilometers above the sun's surface. So it's a very large system of, of uh, plasma and magnetic field going around the sun. Well, the Chinese are also a very keen observer of the sky. So if you study carefully all this recorded stuff from, let's say, Joseph Neum, of uh, Cambridge, that talk about science and civilization in China, you will see that early on, something as early as the Tang Dynasty, 7th century, that they already realized about how the behavior of uh, comets, especially the cometary tails, where they are pointing. And this is actually among the earliest description I've ever been able to, to find describing solar wind, essentially. The, these are basically the, the pressure push out because of the very high temperature near the solar corona up to a million or two million degree, where hydrostatically they are not balanced. They, they have to push out with the outward flow, so you actually have solar wind coming out from the sun. So in Tang Dynasty, you can see this description, which say that in general, when a comet appears in the morning, it tilts always points towards the west. And when they appear in the evening, it tilts point towards the east. This is a constant rule. If the comet is north or south of the sun, it tilts is always pointing, following the same direction as the light radiating from the sun. This is really a very, very uh, interesting uh, observation that they actually have already saw this kind of problem long ago. Here's one of the examples of a, a comet plunging into the sun, of course after its gravitational field has been disturbed, it plunged into the sun, yeah. All right, now, as a proud naturalized citizen, I guess I'm very proud that this year, everything, like I say, click, click together. So there's even an exciting possibility for me to rediscover this first sunspot drawing in America. Something that I'm very, very proud because a few years back, my colleague Jose Vaquero from, uh, from Spain have uh, called attention to these things and say that maybe perhaps this, uh, this, this uh, drawing by Humphrey Marshall, which is a botanist, has been lost. Okay, and then let's see who, but then I think that we can possibly recover these things. So her, here's her Humphrey Marshall. Of course, I'm not showing you his uh, portrait because no one knows how he looked like. In fact, this is actually a model. I happened to talk to the guy who do this painting, Adrian Martinez, recently. So. He talked about, basically, I just want to point to you the, the microscope and the, and the telescope that Ben Franklin bought for him from uh, London. Here, here's a correspondence between uh, 
between, uh, of course, Humphrey Marshall and Ben Franklin. But before we do that, let's just point to the all the available sunspot observation in America, in the colonial America. Uh, as early as 1694, you can see Braddo in Boston, Robbie in Boston, 1722, and then John Winthrop in Cambridge, 1739. And uh, he... My good friend Douglas Hoyt, which we will show who he is, he's the premier uh, uh, sunspot historian. And uh, he said, well, there are 9 to 10 total sunspot observations, but no one has ever seen that they have actually sunspot drawing. So apparently Humphrey Marshall drawing will be the earliest one possible. And this is one example of sunspot drawing from Japan, for example, in 1793. Obviously, the one by Humphrey Marshall will be earlier than that. Like, you, like I say, Humphrey Marshall is a botanist, so his flowers, in fact, are very, very famous that it's appeared in uh, quite a few of these uh, famous gardens in Europe, for example, including the Louis, f the f not 14, but the 15 or something in the Versailles Garden. So Humphrey Marshall is from Pennsylvania. <coughs> and uh, look at the letter that uh, he wrote to Ben Franklin talking about his observation that he observed for 12 months. He only do this during winter months, so when he's not so busy with his botany work, right? And uh, so he did communicate a lot of this stuff to Ben Franklin. And what Ben Franklin did is, as a good scientific person, is that Ben Franklin helped him report in the Royal Society uh, uh, journals. Here is uh, his publication. And indeed, that the, the, the drawing has been uh, that supposed to accompany this publication was, was not never to be found yet. Okay? So, but then, when I talked to Adrian Martinez, oh, this is the letter that Brent Franklin wrote back to Humphrey Marshall, right? Discussing about how he have learned about all these other things, especially all the stuff that he learned from uh, Scotland. There are quite a few of those uh, scientists uh, studying the sun very, very carefully, especially uh, Mr. Wilson from Glasgow, professor of astronomy there. And here is the happy news that, uh, that I got from uh, Adrian Martinez, who say that he indeed has seen five or six years ago this painting, that it does exist. So he will try to look for me for this dot. That he say, yeah, it's a bit like random dots, but I think it's quite important and significant if we can recover this. So this shall be a very, very exciting thing in the next few months to wait for, for uh, Adrian Martinez to, to, to go and recover this in the archive. Well, the among the later, later time in America, Reverend Jonathan Fisher of Maine, Harvard-educated uh, pastor, uh, have also done some sunspot observation, as you can see from uh, 1816. So he has quite a few of that. There is a reason why we want to have a lot of this drawing, because a lot of this thing later we shall explain the context, of course. We need to know where all the spots are distributed on the surface of the sun, especially with respect to the equator and with respect to the rotation axis, right? So we want to know a lot of where these sunspots are. Here's a recent eclipse event showing you that, yep, we possibly be able to find all this stuff from uh, from uh, from America. Yes. Oh, some echo. Okay. Now we're gonna start with this uh, sunspot observation study. The er the era that we're gonna focus on is of course since the telescopic era, so st uh, tele telescope time, since uh, Galileo Galilei time. And here's Galileo Galilei. He's a very very good scientist in uh, quite a lot of ways. And he also know actually how to communicate science very early on. Because science is all about seeking truth. And then all the independent verification of truth. So that's, this is the picture of, of the early days where he already kind of uh, make public a lot of this telescope viewing. Right? He first looked into the, as you know, in some years that I talked in Denver, Colorado, DDP, long ago, where he started observe a lot of this uh, uh, Galilean uh, Jupiter system, the moon. And then he also point to the moon, uh, the on Jupiter, but this one is on our own moon, where you can see a lot of these uh, craters and all these other undulation on the surface of the moon. And then, but he also, of course, point towards the, point towards the, the sun. This is among a compilation of his observation of the sunspot since 1613, right? You can see he almost already got a lot of things right. The, the you can see that the rotation axis is more about like off like seven degree off the vertical. You can see, so it's really a very good uh, sunspot record and observation already. And here is what he says about sunspot. He says that indeed these are not something external to the sun. This is something 
contiguous to the surface of the solar body, right? But they are continually generated and dissolved. And then he gave the analogy, it's a bit like clouds and hurricanes and all those things, right? And then are carried around by the sun itself, which turns on the off about a, a lunar month. So that's quite around, quite correct actually, 27 to 29 days, with a revelation similar to other planets. So, so, so early observation by, by Galileo is already enormously insightful, by the way. So this is a role of very, very good science, uh, science work and science observation. Unfortunately, sun is still extremely complex. Until today, we really don't know very well about how sunspots are indeed generated. Uh, there are all kinds of theoretical ideas about this, and we are able to do a lot of modeling work. And yes, indeed, the sun is, total, as we all know, is, is a nuclear power, nuclear engine, right? It's basically fission of, uh, fusion of two uh, hydrogen and form helium in the, in the internal 30% uh, of the core, right? And then you have an outer region where the, the fluid flow transport will be uh, conducted by radiations, and then there are fluid motion on the outer layer called the convective zone, and then sunspot is roughly where the, near th the, the photosphere, the surface is, right? So another view of the sunspot is basically that there are all kinds of features on the sun. Some are bright, some are dark. Okay, there are reason to those things, obviously. And uh, the most important thing in terms of actually the, the, the light idea, the light output is actually things called the solar faculty, which is, uh, is called light torch in Latin. And uh, here's another video on, uh, on the sunspot. Now we can generate sunspot using MHD simulation. This is not a bad looking thing, but it uh, look too symmetric and not so realistic. Even though we can achieve so much, we basically still don't understand quite a lot of the physics, obviously. Right? And Galileo already talked about the nature of sunspot, right? That it can uh, last for one day to 30 days to 40 days and have irregular, sh irregular shapes and then it going in and out. That sort of thing. So it's in the early days, we still have a lot of guessing, but these are very keen observer of the sky. And there's even a connection of, uh, of uh, Galileo to, to Milton. And then, as we know, there's this impression that, that uh, Milton has visited Galileo when he's already old. So in even in the books of uh, the most famous poems <laughs> of all time, there is a, there's a link of, uh, of sunspot there comparing the arrival of Satan on the on the sun with sunspot, as observed by Galileo through his telescope, right? There lands the Fian, a spot like which perhaps astronomer in the sun loosened up through his glazed optic tube, yet never saw. But the real sunspot cycle was actually discovered by this uh, pharmacist by the name of Samuel Hendrik Schwabe. As you know, his time period is from 1789 to 1875. But he dedicated his free time, so he observed sunspot for almost 17 years, okay, collecting the data, and these are the data that he observed. With this one simple observation of 17 years, look, the discovery of sunspot cycle is there. This is why he was very highly honored in terms of, in terms of his dedication to science. But nobody has ever think that we should actually observe the sun and count the sunspot for 17 years, right, during that time. And one of the translation of why we need to know the location of the spot relative to the rotation axis and distribution above the, let's say, from away from the equator is basically a picture like this, which is called a sunspot butterfly diagram. And the first people that plotted this are actually the Mondas, right? The Mondas that, that, that Monda Minimum were named after. So the Mondas in 1922, for example, at Water Monda and uh, Annie Monda, I'll introduce the picture soon. It's basically telling you about how this, well, the whole idea is that we really want to know the distribution so that we can actually try to explain better how this formation of sunspot come around, of course. And uh, by the way, during the World War, World War II, this is Annie Monda. She was so concerned about this uh, original butterfly diagram being, uh, I guess, uh, taken by the Germans, so we actually sent this away. To, to High Altitude Observatory in Boulder, Colorado, where they kept the original version of this sunspot drawing. 
I'm very lucky to also have met a lot of descendants from, uh, from the Mondes family. And uh, yeah, here's a picture of a sunspot uh, butterfly diagram. This is actually essentially the, the observation by Henrik Schwabe, an extended observation after his first 17 years. And these are water monders and any monders. They are kind of a very, very interesting amateur uh, astronomer. And uh, the water monder was the guy who actually took the daily photograph of the sun from 1876 until he retired in 1928 or so. So this guy has really spent enormous time dedication. And the moon, the crater on the moon is actually named after them. There's one, at least one of them. And this is part of the reason why I spend quite a lot of time, actually one year of my free summer uh, weekend, 52 weeks before these two kids were born. So I was able to do this. There's a lot of freedom back then. So and then I was able to produce this small little book to explain the, the modern minimum phenomenon. All right, now we want to talk about a prolonged sunspot minimum. This is a very famous period that everybody heard about. It's called the Mondo Minimum from 1645 to 1715, right? It's really not only ordinary. There are times in which that the sunspot just don't appear in the sun. That is true during sunspot minimum, for example, on the activity cycle minimum. But they won't last more than like, let's say, 20 days, 100 days, 150 days. But this guy, we kind of seem to have a period that in which extended for 70 years that you don't have sunspot, for example. So in the early days, imagine Galileo was observing the sun. He actually said that there was a lot of sunspot, okay? So Galileo start very early, right? 1613. And then the French astronomer come in 1640s and 1645, they started observing and then they couldn't see anything. They were so frustrated. They are beginning to doubt even uh, the problem that Galileo may be not telling the truth, okay? So this is how confusing back then when you don't have the knowledge. So to put it in context, you can see, right? From 2020 going backward, let's say, from about 1715 to 1645, really there's a period in which there's actually low, low, low sunspot count. It's not that there are no sunspots, except the sunspot is so unusually low, the activity is extremely weak, that you actually have this long period of no sunspot at all, right? And that actually is very, very interesting. If we can understand this phenomenon, I think that we can explain quite a bit of the the cold time and the cold period that, is that we shall be expecting soon, which we'll discuss uh, near the end of this talk. So here's a sunspot di uh, butterfly diagram pointing to the time in which that, if you think about it, most of the sunspot uh, butterfly diagram look like they're very symmetric from north to south. One of the features of modern minimum is that the northern hemisphere appear to have no sunspot at all. It's, uh, it's the southern part that have a lot of spots. But then they are also much squeezed because the latitude don't appear below above anything like 30 or this is only confined to about 20 latitude degree usual so a butterfly diagram goes up to 45 degree okay of north south no wonder they say that when the when during the minimum uh, Monda minimum time is the the sun king that is controlling the the sunspot Louis XIV happened to reign about more or less the same time during 1640 see he reigned from 1643 to 1715 so this is the the fun part about this picture is actually that the the glass of hall in in the Versailles Palace is is the same glass maker that make the the telescope of 60 inch that we use at Mount Wilson that Sally Balunas and myself are using to study the activity on other sun-like stars, so where we can try to see how much more information we can learn, right? So indeed, my colleagues from France. Uh, the late Elizabeth Nam Ribs say that it is the broken butterfly wing during the Mondo Minimum. I think it's very poetic and expressive. So this is the update. Again, we study sunspot like crazy. As you know, this study never, never stopped. So my friend Vaquero and a lot of his friend De uh, Carrasco, they just carefully keep looking through historical record and trying to find what can we learn about sunspot uh, activity during Mondo Minimum era, for example. So you can really see, it's confirmed again, it's real. I, the reason why there was no sunspot is actually confirmed. It's not because there was no one observing. It's actually we have someone observing, but then there was no spot. That was a very, very interesting uh, fact that we can confirm, of course, by now. So here's a perspective over 2,000 years. You can see Mondo Minimum is among the weakest one. And if some of you heard my talks in uh, Las Vegas long ago about the blue sun, where we focus on the sporo minimum period, well, you can see sporum minimum is also weak. In fact, it could be even weaker than the modern minimum. That part, 
we still have to do more research to try to understand exactly how. And since we are at the uh, University of Arizona region, Tucson, here's a professor from uh, Andrew, e Andrew E. Douglas. He's a dendro, dendro uh, I think a dendrologist, yeah. The people who study three rings and yellow pine syndrome, for example, this guy. He's a letter that he wrote to Walter Monder that expressed that indeed that he found that there are very, very poor tree ring growth from 1659 to 1727, right? So you can imagine a bit of a delay of the system, biological system, respond to the, the Monda minimum phenomenon. So it's quite interesting in this sense, right? That you already realize that there is a connection. In fact, people say, oh, it couldn't be, the sign couldn't affect, and that doesn't explain little ice age and so on and so forth, right? And then there are some wider perspective. For example, the late Gerard Bond from uh, Columbia University uh, study a lot of this, uh, what you call the ice uh, debris that is carried by an uh, iceberg and then drop all these droplets of study the rocks that in the ocean sediment. They were able to extend the record of the, the sun back to 12,000 years, for example, and really recognize that, uh, that the modern minimum cold decades of uh, the little ice age could not have been a coincidence. That's a conclusion some 20 years back. Well another fun connection is basically the time period of Mondo Minimum is among also the enlightenment time in some sense, even though weather was cold and wet and all that stuff, but it's able to give us the finest wood quality from the, from the northern Italian region where you can make this famous uh, Stradivari virus, uh, Stradivari uh, uh, violin, right? And uh, so it's a very interesting one. But more interesting to most of us in this crowd is actually coffee, isn't it? Right? Uh, the first coffee house was, uh, was, uh, was uh, formed in England, 1652. And the Oxford students, they were really smart early on. So those people know that coffee will, will give them more stamina to study more stuff. So very early on, this was already established before, of course, the coffee phenomenon s spread to Paris and Germany and so on and so forth. So very good. I haven't had my coffee yet, so <laughs> if I sound sleepy. But now let me get to my work now. This is the two papers that we just published. This first paper I published with uh, Victor Velasco, and then, of course, we asked for help from uh, David Legates, our good friend here. Some technical issues that he was able to help us resolve. Science is all about this sort of endeavor, right? You don't have to do all the things by yourself, actually. As you have friends that you can trust and do work together, okay, Dave, come on, man, help us out. <laughs> so that's what Dave is helping us. And then in the meantime, hopefully Dave will learn something about machine learning. This is the whole idea that you can teach the computer how to do a painting like this, right? Do it under the Van Gogh style of painting. Starry Night, for example, right? And then you can even have it any other thing you want it on the Turner, uh, William Turner's uh, uh, painting or Edward Munch or Kardinsky or even Pablo Picasso painting style. You take a picture and then you tell the machine to learn about how you do these things. And that's a basic idea. We actually fed in all the information about sunspot uh, activity record that we have and then tell the machine that, okay, make a decision and find all the prominent uh, cycle periods and uh, what other things that you find and so on and so forth. So we study this record from 1700 to 2019 on this first paper. Okay, and then we are able to show that we can replicate all the all the results and we can high cast it. And then the specific thing that we were able to do that I'm very proud of is indeed that with no prior information, we are able to show that there were during a period from 1730 to 1760, indeed that they were missing sunspot. This, this machine was able to tell us machine algorithm. And then we were also able to fast forward the projection, the uh, forward forecasting sunspot till about 2100 or so, right? And we show that the sunspot activity will be weak. In fact, it has been weak already since 2008. But then now 2021, we are still in a weak state. The next cycle we believe will be weak too. So we'll last until 2050s. That's basically the bottom line of the result. Here's an example that you will teach the machine how to draw uh, in the Van Ho style, right? Painting. Again, I have to say that indeed, science is the organized unpredictability, so my apology to Professor Freeman Dyson for making attempt to forecast. But I've really been sitting on this problem for a very long time. This is, by the way, is, is not the same thing as you are trying to do this uh, Peri period analysis and all that. It's a very, very sophisticated method now. One of the s things that you must always show, of course, is that if you have observation, which is the black curve, 
And then we have two methods of, uh, of hind casting, right? The blue and the red curve. You can see that we can do pretty well for cycle transport cycle 23 and 24, right? And here's a whole picture where you can see from 1730 to 1760, that's a period that we, fall, we hind cast that we think that there was some missing sunspot, okay? And then the future one, as you can see, up to 2100. And we can show you that we can fully recover all of this record. Yes, indeed, that if you ask yourself, how well were the sun being observed during 1730 to 1760? The answer is not very well, indeed. So there's not much observation there. So indeed, that we really think that we should be able to hope to keep finding to verify this fact. Here's the actual plot from 1600 to about 2000, right? Showing you, actually up to 2020 even, uh, showing you the, what you call the number of days with a re record per decade, right? You can see during those periods, the sunspots are very, very well observed, uh, less observed during 1730s, to and then indeed you can see during Monday Minimum, the record are so much better observed. This is why we are confident. We don't see sunspot during Monday Minimum, not because no one is observing. People are indeed observing. So this is a very, very good thing. Uh, by the way, this is actually a big challenge to the solar physics community. No one has ever done uh, said this before us. So I'm very proud to be able to produce this original result. And as you can see, the name like Hoy and Shatten is have appeared quite a lot in a lot of this work. Douglas Hoyt happened to be also a good colleague of mine. So I have already met him in 1993 well, during my first international meeting to Observatoire de Paris where we stand and speak about sunspot right at the zero degree longitude. So it was very interesting place to be. But anyway, Douglas Hoyt is the foremost uh, sunspot historian. So he has already observed early on that indeed it's during all this period, 1723 to 1759, where they're actually not very good, reliable sunspot value, right? So it's really completely independent. We already have the result first, and then we check the literature and go through this. So that's a very interesting part of it. And then now, you have this uh, modern period. I say that if I were to have any opportunities at all, I would try to name this Hoyt minimum for the future sense, if we are correct. And just a reminder, like you say, studying sunspot is a family event. So now is my daughter's uh, sun painting. <laughs> now I'm going to move to the second part. Second part shall be on the, the sunspot, studying the sunspot group. Sunspot group is very, very large entity on the sun. Okay? It's much easier to count, but then it's also quite complicated in other ways. But here's what we do. Sunspot group is very, very large size. I mean, the Earth size is really, really tiny little dot on the, on the system. And indeed, that please don't worry about it. There's a lot of detailed sunspot. Indeed, has been studied for a long time. People know how to classify them back and so on and so forth. So with Douglas Hoyt, the original work of Hoyt and Shatton, we were able to recover his results, right? And we use this result to find what happened during the Mondo Minimum period. So indeed, that we're also able to add more insights about what happened. The, for example, one of the questions during Mondo Minimum, did the solar dynamo, which is the one of the primary possibility to explain sunspot activity cycle. Did it still operate? Do you still have sunspot cycle? Which shows that indeed there are sunspot cycle during, you would still have sunspot cycle during Mondo Minimum period from 1645 to 1715. That's part of the work that we are actually producing now. We submitted to solar physics for, for publication. We also, in this work, we have so many problems. First of all, we not only have to deal with modern, postmodernist, revisionist point of view, we also have to deal with one very serious problem that was produced by Rudolf Wolf, which is actually the primary sunspot record builder from, from the 19th century, 1850 or so, right? This Rudolf Wolf is from Switzerland, and then we found out that he's right, he actually was, did some very uh, not good uh, adjustment that need to be corrected. So with this paper, we clarify all the full story and finally try to set the record straight. Hopefully that our colleagues will, 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 will s and now of course we show all the evidence. So I'm fairly convinced that this is the highest quality work that one can ever produce. And that's why I'm very proud to be able to stand here to tell you that we're doing this work, okay? So here's a work on sunspot, uh, group sunspot numbers and we're able to show you all the glory details. And now let's move a little bit faster. Let's go to the the idea about, about uh, activity cycle. Even Monda, by 1922, early on, already suspected that actually the sunspot cycle didn't die away. 
That's why he pointed out that 1660, 1671, 1684, 1695, 1707, 1718 are where the sunspot maxima is at. If you compare this prediction by, by Mondes compared to our calculation, okay, our, our deduction from the machine learning, we actually match it quite well. And then when you study other new people rec record, for example, the beryllium 10 from Juke Beer et al., they are completely way off. So we are, we are happy. We don't know who is right and wrong, obviously, but then we think that our result is quite good. Okay. And by the way, on the mono minimum, as you can see, that the, the fastest way to learn more about this is actually to study other sun-like stars in, in the whole galaxy, right? And here is one of the work that shows that there's, there are some uh, activity mono minimum uh, candidate. This is uh, Salu Baruna's uh, paper with our paper. It uh, actually. My 31, some 40 years of scientific career, this is my top cited paper, right? By almost like 2,000 citation or something. And this is among our work that we are very proud of from Mount Wilson, so we produce these results. And uh, I'm very happy now, a lot of people are using our database to continue the work further on. Here's one of the work that they did. They took some of our old data and then we added new data to it and shows you that, look, they even detected solar cycles for these other stars, 10.4 years. So it, it is not only appearing in our sun itself, but it's also appeared in, uh, in, in other sun-like stars. There are activity cycles during very, very weak time, except the amplitude is very small, of course. So here's a full picture. The full picture is essentially that we think we are already in the minimum. So I would I say that if we were correct, so in another 20, 30 years, it should be low, and then we will call this thing a Hoyt minimum, obviously. And then in this paper, we work very hard to be accurate to the history. So we, we propose that we're going to name the so-called Dalton minimum to be Dalton Wolf minimum. And then the, the what they call the modern uh, 20th century minimum should be Gleisberg and Warmeyer minimum. And then of course, Monda minimum should be not remain unchanged. So this is Douglas Hoy, a colleague of mine who is retired already. And he lives in uh, West Virginia now. Quickly, why is it so important to, to predict sunspot activity? You all know, right? The sun is getting active right now, right? Cycle 25 is here. So they're already showing signs. The cycle 25 is here. This is the same butterfly diagram. The colors are again showing you the polarity of the spots, right? They are showing you that the previous one was uh, cycle 24. Now the 25 is already starting. You can see. So everybody now wants to predict what the cycle 25 will be, right? The thing that I want to compare here is that this is the NOAA group, the consensus uh, uh, group trying to predict that taking some, I don't know, 20 uh, different uh, uh, predictions uh, then, and then compare to, let's say, I pointed out here the highlight here, the special uh, uh, prediction by Scott McIntosh et al. from High Altitude Observatory, where, where he predicted the next sunspot 25 should be 223 sunspot or so. We, on the other hand, predict about 100 or 95 to 100. And, and he was very unhappy when we pointed out that Look, you actually predicted very, very high. So you have as low as 153, as high as, as 305. Okay? This is the kind of people like that. I mean, they're completely funded by our taxpayer money. And then when every time people say like that, oh, you say, no, I didn't say this. But then if you look at his paper, he actually predicted that amount. He wrote that in his own paper. And I don't know why these people are doing things like this, right? You actually say in your paper and then you won't even admit it because probably he's very afraid now his data is, is going to be not correct, right? So let's wait. A few more years, we'll see. This is our forecast for cycle 25 using machine le learning, right? So I'm not afraid to contrast that. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. So what? <laughs> but anyways, you can compare the uh, Macintosh uh, idea versus the NOAA average, the NOAA group average. But we are ours is a bit lower. And then not only that, we, we are so accurate that we are able to predict the timing of where this, this maxima is going to be. Okay. Very quickly is that we need, need to study these things. Here is another example of an amateur uh, sunspot observer by the name of Richard Carrington. He's a beer brewer. And indeed, he spent a lot of his time studying the sun during free time. So this is his observatory and his brewery where he happened of all the things that you want to study in the sun, this is among the most important ones. 1859, he actually saw suddenly on a special area of the sunspot group, things are lightened up. Okay, It's a solar flare phenomenon or corona mass ejection, for example. 
But science is not only that what Richard Carrington say. During exactly nearly the same time, there was another guy named John, Mr. Hawk, Hawkson. Hawkson actually saw it too. So he got an independent confirmation. Not only that, if you go back now to modern time, you actually are able to find record of such thing recorded in the ice in Antarctica. Okay? If you measure the NO3 concentration in the ice, where you suspect the, the solar flare will produce an uh, enhancement of this, this concentration of these particles, or of this uh, chemical species. So you can see this thing. And so what happened? First thing is New York Times. New York Times reported that aurora happened when you have such a solar flare event. And then the most consequential thing is obviously is related to, to discharge, I mean electric grid. Here's one estimate basically saying that if we don't prepare now, if we have one of these huge events like the Carrington event in 1859, it's going to cost us something of the order of uh, one to three trillion dollars. Right? Because you really need to be prepared. And the preparedness is a very strange thing, by the way. We talk for years and years and years. You have multiple meetings. You have NAS report, this and that. They have already produced a lot of report. Until now, you actually ask them, do you have more extra transformer make and be ready for it? I can tell you they will say no. These people are shameless people who constantly want to go meeting after meeting. And um, by the way, I'm very fed up with this sort of behavior too. This is why no, <laughs> no, no wonder I no longer to go to any of this meeting or any of this club meeting. No, 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 I'm not going. So one of the consequences is telegraph being, being disrupted in real time, right? And then another interesting thing is actually related to uh, uh, whales. The whales are, are being disturbed by, by, the, by the solar flare events actually, right? And here's one of the examples, and people indeed documented some statistics related to those things. And they even beach up, right? This, this, the whale, they just die. It's very, very interesting that some of the whale can live up to 200 years, so a bit older than even the, the Moby Dick before the book was produced. But in the past, the phenomenon of beaching is already known for long ago. Here is one from uh, Holland, I believe, 1577, this phenomenon. But you know what? Something that we need to worry about is that basically how large of a solar flare can you get? Solar flare you can get because now we observe other sun-like stars. We actually found that uh, there are very energetic flare events that can go up to 10 to the 36, another thousand times bigger than what we ever observe on the sun, which is 10 to the 33, the highest. The average is about 10 to the 29 ergs. Okay? So we indeed that these are all related to the size of spots. Bigger spots one tends to have a higher probability of producing very, very massive ejection, massive solar flare event. So indeed, one has to watch for this sort of thing, right? So European Space Agency have another new mission. I think this is called the Lagrange mission. They already plan it should be, uh, yeah, launch date expected 2023. This, this one is quite a good idea. And uh, the whole idea is that you want to place your spacecraft at the uh, Lagrangian point, L5. Instead of L1 or L4 or L3, you play at L5 so you get a bit of a warning system before you arrive towards us. So you get like maybe an hour or less or, or even more kind of warning. It's a very interesting thing that when I showed this in a talk in uh, Camp Constitution the other day, immediately the first person asked, can't they use this to try to manipulate us? Oh yeah, indeed. Uh, so everybody should look forward to Patrick Wood talk today. It's technocracy. It's another one of those. Yeah, they could manipulate us. This is just uh, finished to end my talk. And now, before I end, I want to introduce properly the new Biden administration presidential committee on national science, the Medal of Science, Professor David Legates, who shall speak next. <laughs> By the way, David Legates has a lot of story to tell, which I hope he will tell at other occasions. He was uh, on the Trump administration uh, uh, job for a while, for I don't know, no more than uh, six months. And then he's heavily prosecuted, very, very sadly. I mean, these people say that he's a criminal. They're trying to charge him with three criminal counts. Hopefully, luckily that even the liberal uh, Maryland court refused to, to, to take on the case because it's just no case. So it's very sad. But I'm very proud to call him a friend. So Dave, come on up. Thank you.
Okay, any question, please? Sure. Okay. Okay, of course, the, the uh, interesting phenomenon is the watts per meter squared. One to two watts per meter squared per the IPCC has a significant effect on, you know, weather and climate versus 1,000 watts per meter squared top of the atmosphere down to 300. So are we measuring watts per meter squared associated with the sunspots? I saw a power anomaly up there. Can't we measure the change in watts per meter squared, the radiative force change associated with the sunspot uh, phenomenon? Uh, if, you, if you read the early on the, the, the work that we did with Art Robinson, we already defined about the best measurement in terms of total energy of the whole Earth. The best measurement is actually the albedo. And that albedo is, we, is no good up to 10 watt per meter square. That already tells you the kind of problem we are facing, isn't it? Right? That's the best, most accurate measurement. The rest of it are adjusted. In fact, all the product coming from all these satellite projects, they are not real numbers. They are not real numbers. They are using model and then assimilated and adjusted number and then they get numbers. It's a very difficult if you want to do the pure measurements from, from that. So the best measurement of accuracy is actually no more than 10 watt per meter square. 10 to 20 even, I would say. That's why cloud is such a difficult thing to, to measure. Okay? And yeah, yeah, it's a very difficult measurement, for sure. And then we find out all kinds of anomalies. So read, for example, this review article that we just published. We have a lot of new insight that we put into this review paper. I was very proud to invite by this, this uh, Chinese academician, one of the premier solar physicists in China, to ask me to write this review article for their journal. So hopefully they won't cancel us. It's supposed to appear already any time now. Well, but I've been waiting since May. <laughs> so I'm patient enough. But, but this journal also, I'm very glad that they allow us to put a press release. They put it on their, their journal page. So they give us such a high honor. I mean, all my colleagues there are very, very nice. I mean, except now, the official publisher is the UK group called Institute of Physics. And then something is very strange now. I mean, why are they delaying for so long? Now they told me it's formatting problem, which I don't like. What formatting is already done, actually. <laughs> By the Chinese group, by the way, you know that, right? They, but the official paper is already published in the Chinese uh, uh, webpage, and then we just wait for the DOI number to appear in the IOP, Institute of Physics, which is published in England. Hi, James. Willie, first of all, fantastic talk, as always. And of course, fomenting problems. Uh, of course, scientists aren't supposed to do that. They're supposed to comply, right? That's right. <laughs> but my question is this. In one of your slides at the very top, it said something along the lines of, Angry Schmidt, you are not allowed to cite my study. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, hold on. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, no wonder people keep asking me. Yes, it's Gavin, <laughs> Gavin Schmidt, OK, from uh, the NASA director. I want to find where it is, actually. It's totally about, it about a quarter of the way through, I think. Okay, yeah. sorry. So you hear another round of my talk. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Yes, yes, yes. In, in our review article, in our review article, of course we cited everyone. I, I, I don't think we cited him too positively. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, let me get that just to get the context. I'm trying to understand and remind myself. Remember, the paper has 535 references, okay? <laughs> and uh, it's a huge uh, compilation of all the basic, all the under and understanding that I have. But then uh, Gavin Schmidt says that, uh, that he's, we are not supposed to cite him, yeah. That he's insulted that we cited his work. That's basically what he commented on the site. Yeah, 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 yeah. He basically, he saw this and then, oh, this one, sorry. This stuff about you're not allowed to sign my paper is related to, unfortunately, our friend Dave Legate's effort in the White House. That we're supposed to publish this uh, climate uh, education, uh, what you call flyers. And then, uh, of course, it got high attention and then uh, Schmidt read about it and then he said that we have the audacity to cite him. <laughs> Too bad for angry Schmidt. <laughs> so he tells us that, oh well, yeah, we're not supposed to cite his paper. 
That this is how it works, right? But I don't think so. So I apologize. I mean, if they disagree, come on, angry Schmidt, come and debate here. We're, we're waiting for you. Uh, looking into the camera. <laughs> Any more questions? I think it's out of time. Thank you.